<laughs> so, um, let me get my joke paper. It would have been great if the music was cut abruptly. I know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, honestly, I, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I was going to do the whole, just flew in, arms tired, but then I would hate myself for it entirely. <laughs> Uh, my name is Athena. I own Pop Right Music Group. We're a boutique label um, out of Maryland. Uh, I say Baltimore, but it's really Columbia, Maryland. And uh, we've been doing these some iteration of this lecture for about four years or so. And in that time frame, we put together an online, um, I guess it's a, just a music industry school or platform, a course. And we decided um, we want to do things differently than how people usually do them. We don't do the whole monthly subscription thing. We, we don't do any of that. We don't charge people to come to our lectures. Um, I'm sure some people would be like, why? Um, but I hope to answer that question, not just through the content, uh, but by the end, if you have any questions. Um, the long and short of it is, uh, the music industry is not changing fast enough to warrant something like a monthly subscription. So if you go online, and, and there's some phenomenal people out there that teach very similar uh, similarly to how I do, uh, at least with the uh, the more tangible stuff, um, but I just don't feel right about charging people to learn whether or not I might be a good fit. Like, I just don't know that that unless it would have gone to the host. Um, I'm just very much of the belief that if you resonate with what I'm saying, it's your call. Uh, so, of all the things we have to talk about and of all the ways uh, we can make money as a musician, my approach is a little different. Uh, my goal is to spend the first third of the uh, talk just kind of talking about fundamentals, uh, mindset mindset shifts to be more entrepreneurial. Um, I promise it's not frou-frou. I promise everything will make sense by the end. Uh, then we'll talk about more branding, different necessary materials needed to get bigger, uh, more higher paying gigs. And then in the third section, we're going to actually go through and dissect some of the ways uh, in which a musician can make money. How do we do any successful booking outside of our market um, uh, in 2023? You know, and when I started playing, you would go to the venue, you would shake hands, you would meet people, and now everyone's just online. And uh, how do we know who's legit? You know, so many people can look good online, but very few people can actually pull people to a venue. Uh, so again, my name is Athena. I own Pop Riot Music Group. I'm in two uh, indie bands, Prism Waves and Circuit Villains. Prism Waves is like, uh, think of Radiohead meets St. Vincent. Uh, Circuit Villains is like Queens of the Stone Age, Royal Blood. Um, I promise I'm not here to promote my bands, but I will be throwing them under the bus uh, to highlight many of my mistakes so that you do not have to do um, any of those. Uh, like I said, the Cadence Labs, this, uh, this Lecture, how to actually make money as a musician, is part of a larger uh, course that we call the Cadence Labs. Uh, essentially, our goal is to teach musicians how to be successful entrepreneurs. We're not interested in blips of success. Like it doesn't doesn't do us any good to sell a really good product one time. You know, if this is something that we want to do all the time, we need to have long-term success. So that is my goal. Um, oh, would be great. If, yeah. So I am not going to tell you, you ever been online and you think music marketing and then you pull out Instagram and it's like 10,000 ads of nothing but, and it's always the same, right? They're like, do this exact formula, bomb emoji, bomb emoji, bomb emoji, it's like wall of text. Um, that, that's not gonna be this. I'm not gonna tell you how to mimic what I'm doing. I'm gonna teach you how the industry, like how the machine of the industry works, uh, entrepreneurial ventures so that you can feel confident testing out certain things what might work for me may not work for you. What might not have worked for me may be the thing that helps you. So it wouldn't be right for me to demand that you mimic everything that I've done. Uh, I'm not going to give you empty advice, like just be on TikTok and post every day. In fact, I will likely say the, the total opposite by the end. Uh, we're also not just gonna sit here and blame the industry. I'm never, ever, ever going to make you choose between your art and the business. Uh, although I'm sure we're all very familiar with that position. And uh, I'm not going to reduce everything down to underwhelming lists. Like, oh, you just gotta like feel it, man. Um, I want things to be tangible and I want things to, to make sense. So if at any point uh, you have a question that you don't wanna hold till the end, just let me know. Um, this is what, we'd like, what I'd like for today. 
I really want to, if I do anything today, to show that being a successful musician is akin to being a successful entrepreneur. And as we'll learn very shortly, you cannot separate them. No matter what anyone tells you, I promise you that your passion for art, your devotion to art is not jeopardized if you start thinking about business or money or you know, being a successful entrepreneur. Uh, this is what I'd like to cover today. Um, you know, we're gonna start with our fundamentals. I'd like to touch on how labels work, how we can benefit from it. Um, we developed um, an approach to goal setting called sta Stackles. Um, who here is a fan of video games? D&D? I'm, I am, okay. I guess, I, yeah, apparently we're the only cool ones here. Uh, a lot of this, the stat goals, is based off of that, and I'll explain that uh, when we get there. Uh, I, I find tangible walkaways important, so I really want to go through the necessary materials you'll need at any stage of your career. Um, branding, uh, and the particular approach to branding, how that can help us develop products that sell. And then, of course, uh, I want to go through different avenues of how to make money as a musician. Uh, typically, we would do this in like three part, we do a three part series where we dive like super into detail. Unfortunately, we don't have that luxury today, but if it's something that you like, maybe Adam can, can hook it up. Um, so I will go through as much of this as I can, um, but I also have nowhere to be afterward. So all nighter. So uh, well, the first thing we're gonna do is talk uh, four mindset shifts and we're gonna begin our journey just changing the way that we think, starting with kicking the door in, money is not evil. Uh, it's not. It's so easy for us to pretty much say all of the three of the four things that we're listing here. Uh, money is not going to change who you are. You shouldn't feel guilty for wanting it. And as we'll learn very shortly, it actually will assist you in not only making better products, but developing a better, um, more tangible approach to entrepreneurship. And it also allows you to help your community. Um, you are not wrong for wanting money. And I stress that because as musicians, we are made to feel very guilty for making money our goal. We're told, well, you couldn't possibly love music if you prioritize money. And I'm not telling you to prioritize money over everything, as in singularly. I'm letting you know that if we prioritize money while aiming to never compromise on our creative ideals, we can't really go wrong. Uh, and of course, that takes having a value system. But in and of itself, that is the first thing. Uh, Warren Buffett has a really, really cool quote that I like. Of the billionaires I have known, money just brings out the basic traits in them. So what I love about this quote is that if you're a giving individual and you only have five bucks to spare, you're going to still be a giving individual if you have 5,000 bucks to spare, five million bucks to spare. Uh, and then vice versa, if someone was stingy, chances are they were always gonna be stingy, no matter how much money they had. And the reason I stress this is because Again, we are made to feel as though we shouldn't want money while pursuing an art to the point where I feel confident saying that a lot of musicians are traumatized when it comes to wanting money. You're supposed to be like, I love music and I'll, I'll just, you know, I'm happy playing for free. Really? No. I promise you, no one here would be satisfied living paycheck to paycheck if they had an opportunity to do more. Um, so, uh, your career should really, in essence, the business of your music should function no differently than a financial firm downtown. And really, it's all about having more ins than outs. Uh, and, and we will get into that uh, when we talk about our tangibles, uh, our products. Well, like I said before, we're made to feel like we can't want these two things, that it's impossible. They're not mutually exclusive. There is no way that we can honor our art without prioritizing money as well. Anyone here uh, a session drummer or like you you know, you record or any like any time that you've played a gig or worked with someone that you rather have not played with you're like okay I'm never going to tell anyone about this gig right we shouldn't in an ideal well we say in an ideal world but really if you position yourself in a way where you're getting compensated fairly for your talent you should never have to take a gig that you wouldn't normally want to take you're not honoring your art that way now again a, a seemingly bad gig might turn into a, a pretty good one. But I have friends that are producers, for example, that have recorded people that they would have never recorded just because they needed to make rent. Of course, we all have to make those decisions, but that's not our journey. That's not our ongoing journey as musicians. Um, number two, the music industry is not out to get you. That's another really easy narrative to just sort of take in. Um, 
uh, well, I'm still playing, you know, Metro Gallery downtown uh, with the same bands uh, because the music industry just doesn't like what I do. I promise you, there's like pig squeal core that's touring to actual fans. So I promise yeah. you that everyone here is doing something that is marketable where you can develop fans. Um, the music industry is massive and it's super easy for us to think it's us versus them. Uh, and there are actual tangible reasons why we hear the same songs on the radio, why it seems like the same type of artists get chosen, but there are actual reasons for it. It's not this, like vampiric corporation dudes that drink the blood of super talented musicians just for the mere sport of it. And we, being the heroes, we are the valiant, brave artists that will single-handedly save the industry one we did a thing post at a time. I promise you it's nothing like that. Uh, when we think about the music industry, and this is something we go into in a lot of detail in the course, uh, the reason why we tend to hear a lot of what, a lot of the same um, artists is because of risk assessment, right? If I'm putting my money into something and I am not entirely sure that it's gonna work out, I'm gonna be a bit timid and apprehensive about moving forward with that. Now the flip side is, the, the joy of music, as we'll talk about, is when it's honest, when it's unique, when there's something you can latch onto. If you think of some of the biggest names out there, from the Rolling Stones to Madonna to even Lady Gaga, they, they aren't doing anything unheard of, but it's honest, it's sincere, it's genuine, which is why it works. Uh, a lot of the big wig guys that have a lot of money, it's very tempting for them to go, well, Miley Cyrus works who is a genuine artist with a lot of authenticity and talent. So instead of taking it a risk, the risk that we took on her, on this other person, I'm gonna guarantee myself money if I go for these Miley Cyrus sound-alikes. Um, so another advantage to making money a priority for us is that we start to build up a lot of um, capital. So we need those big wigs less and less. We're able to pay our own way. And when we do get a deal, we can say, well, actually, I've." I can get that covered. Uh, what else can you do for me? That gives us a lot of power. Like I said earlier, uh, you cannot separate music and entrepreneurship. If we go back to January 2020, in the, before, the before times, yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, we go to any touring musician or, or full-time musician and we're like, hey, um, what would you do if like all of your gigs got canceled? Their response would say, would be like, uh, well, that would never happen, so why would you even bring that up? And then two months later, the thing that we, we literally would have put our entire life savings into that would never happen. It happened. So many of my friends had no worth. They had no money. And because they didn't claim anything, they couldn't get anything for it. So it's that idea of what, the whole narrative of being anti-industry, anti-business really hurt them in a way that, I'm not saying they wouldn't have suffered, but had they approached things a little differently, maybe they wouldn't have suffered as much. Um, so again, we aren't just artists with this quirk. We're business owners. We have to think like one, we have to act like one. Um, you're not a sellout if you think about business. You're not, I promise you, you're not. Um, I can't measure being a sellout. That's the, the unf well, it's not unfortunate. That's the funny thing about sellout. It's all subjective. If you are sincere about your approaches, say you totally pivot from like metalcore to pop, some people might be like, well, what, what happened here? But if it was something sincere and you were like, oh, well, I'm done with this, I wanna start something new, then you're not, you're not a sellout. And if anything, at the very least, you are not a sellout if you think about business. And the last thing, uh, the last sort of mindset shift is that mindset is everything. And this is where, this is like the first of the frou-frou, the potential frou-frou stuff. Um, how we think dictates how we act. And um, I know, I know it's just weird. You're like, just tell me how to make money. Uh, it's online, I promise you. Those lists, this truncated list that I will show you, it's, uh, it's online for free. I'm assuming and, and hoping that the reason you're here is because you've done those things and it's just not working. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I probably know the answer because there's only a few cool kids in here. Has anyone here played Breath of the Wild? Zelda game? 
you know, you guys, come back here. Come back here when you're cultured and ed educated. Well, you know, I, I guess it won't make sense, but I will say that in this spectacular game that everyone needs to play, and the sequel's coming out in 10 days, um, Princess Zelda is trying to awaken her powers. And she goes to the Three Springs to pray to try to get her powers back. But she goes there anticipating defeat. It's not gonna work, it's not gonna work. The second spring, she's like, well, it's definitely not gonna work. By the third spring, she has all but accepted that it's not gonna work, right? And although I can go on forever about Breath of the Wild, you know, I'll turn it back to say, have we ever given 100% when we've anticipated the worst? Like, it's good to be prepared, but it's different to be prepared versus accepting that the worst is already gonna happen. Like, I know a few people, myself included in the past, I'll be like, well, I just expect the worst just so I can, uh, you know, be surprised. But we're, then that means that we're working in a state of anticipated disappointment. So uh, the easiest way I can sort of break down the mindset, number four, is your brain listens to everything. Absolutely everything is learnable and your goals are valuable, I know. I'm gonna put a little star, maybe it's like a, I should get one of those star emojis for like frou-frou warning, please stick with me. Number one, your brain listens to everything. Again, if we're constantly saying, well, this is gonna suck, I'm not gonna be able to do this, that's exactly how, um, how it's going to react. Uh, how we think, how we approach our problems, how we look at our goals as musicians is going to dictate how and whether we achieve our goals. If we're sitting here going, well, you know, I, I, I really want to tour the world, but I just don't want to look like an idiot. So yeah, I'll be happy playing, you know. Is it Chameleon Club up here? Is that the a club? It's, it's, yeah. it's gone? Yeah. yeah, it was here forever too. So. What? The village closed too. What? Yeah, I just talked about place. the village. Well, what's around here now? Tell us 360. Tell us 360. They have a power to some smaller shows. Oh my god. I, the places are yeah. I, I was just talking to someone about the village and they're like, it's been there forever. My business mentor said, oh my gosh, yeah, that he used to do a bunch of shows uh, in Central PA and that was like the spot. Yeah, that was the spot. The in November. The COVID. It's up for sale. I wish. You guys want to go on a on a venture? <laughs> Man, that is so unfortunate. There's well, other new venues that are popping up though. Like in York, uh, there's the JB Love Drafts has a couple different places, which yeah. is like within the last few years. Uh, H Mac in Harrisburg is yeah. becoming bigger. So there's a couple places that are working to get bigger, but yeah. Lancaster is losing it. Yeah. That's so weird because I've I've always seen Lancaster as like yep. a, an arts hub. Yeah. Weird. Um, All right. All right. Well, will someone hold me afterwards? <laughs> 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 um, so the uh, the the second thing, everything is learnable. I I include this because as musicians, it's really easy for us to be like, I just love the music, man. I just want to write. That's all I can do. And I promise you, like. If you think of some of the smartest people in the world, right? Neurosurgeons. Not one single neurosurgeon has gone on to do neurosurgery with the same knowledge that they were born with, right? Of course, they have certain um, tendencies and um, you know they have their strengths, but each and every one of them went to school <laughs> to learn how to perform this intricate and involved thing. So if a neurosurgeon can learn how to do that, then we can learn how to advertise or market or you know turn our music into tangible products and that's not taking away from how important our job is but it's not hard it's not let me let me rephrase it's not complicated there's a difference between simple and easy right it's not always easy but the idea of creating a business and getting more ins than outs is not a foreign one the issue that we have as musicians, and this is something that I'll repeat later, is what we have is exceptionally transcendent, right? Uh, if we think about our favorite song, that thing has stuck with us forever. I remember the songs that have been with me during some really, really hard times. And those were like years ago. I still think about them and get shivers and like, you know, goosebumps. We can't package that and sell it easily. Like, you know, the way I feel about a specific song, you might like it, but it might not feel the same way. 
So how do we represent that magic, that insanely transcendent feeling into tangible products that sell? And, and this is the whole point of what we're aiming to do is, is to teach that. Um, if I had it my way, each and every musician that approached this like a business would start off doing what they need to do and would end up developing a system where they delegate their roles. You know, of course now money doesn't grow on trees. We don't have that system established. So it's important to learn how social media advertising works. You know, how does uh, streaming work and should I put X amount of money in it or not? And, and I, I love talking about streaming. So if I don't go into it as much, we can definitely talk about it. And also it's important to learn how things work so that when you do hire someone, you're not hiring someone who just looks good. Again, now everyone looks important. Uh, on Instagram uh, or wherever. So uh, it's important to know what we're hiring for. And if there's something that you really like, then you end up saying, well, I'm gonna do this for a little bit longer. That's what happened with advertising. I was learning advertising so I can hire someone and I loved it. So I'm holding on to it a little bit more. And the last thing that I really wanna um, you know, push is that your goals are valuable. Um, I, I'm sure all of you are very familiar with the glossy eyed look. You're like, what do you do? I'm a musician. And they're like, Ooh, sorry, I'm so sorry. You know, they expect you to be a certain way, act a certain way, um, you know, go paycheck to paycheck. And, and unfortunately, we sort of accepted that as a reality. I don't know of a single successful entrepreneur who sat and said, I have this great idea, but man, I'm just a little weird saying it out loud. Uh, if your goal is to tour with um, KISS, I don't know, then say it because it's very possible to, to do that. It's not an unheard of thing. You're not asking to say, well, I want to establish uh, a colony you know, on the sun. <laughs> you're, not, you're not saying something that at this very moment in present time is impossible. Um, and we'll go to uh, that when we talk about our stack goals. Um, I typically go into a lot more detail with uh, the Business 101 stuff. If I go a little too fast, let me know. Um, my business mentor, Mike Bray, he owns uh, Bobby Organism Records. He also owns Hobby Works. It's a hobby store. Um, and so he gets this experience being in music for all of his life and then also having a very successful um, set of stores. Uh, that are not music related. And when we first met, he helped me get my acquisition loan for my non-music business. And the very first thing he told me in our meeting was business is not rocket science. To have a successful business, you need more pluses than minuses. You need to make more money than you spend. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, Athena, I did not just come here for you to tell me common sense. But yet, what I will say to that is, we all know this, but yet all of us, myself included, as musicians hemorrhage money for the art and we're totally okay with not making it back because because it's just the thing that we want to do and this is where i i said this to someone at uh we were talking afterward and it did not go well uh we talked it through but it was it hit a sore spot um if you have more ins than outs you have a business if you have more outs than ins you have a hobby and when I wrote that down, I pissed myself off because I was like, there's no way that music is a hobby for me. But th that's the first thing we need to accept is, you know, spend the money on what we need to spend the money on. Like having three, four, maybe five different drum sets. What do you think yeah, about that? Like, yeah. That's number one. Totally, primary. absolutely <laughs> primary, especially if you're not a drummer. Um, you know, this is the, yeah, there it is. The, the offensive little slide here. Um, we need to position ourselves in a place where we know exactly how much we're making and how much we're spending. If I ask you guys, can, do you have an expense report? Can you tell me how many drums, what, what you spent on drumsticks in the last year? Uh, did you write off any expenses as a musician last year? Oh man, you should have, and, and we'll talk I, about that. I have a friend that told me to start doing that. Oh, then, yeah. Yeah, it's, I would, you know, the more you make it into a business, the more it comes Absolutely. Yeah. And, and honestly, you, you, can, you can make make your business into an LLC, which is what we'll quickly talk about. But um, the first, I went years not doing it, right? And I played piano, so I bought this Nord, I bought this, I bought that, thousands of dollars. And I remember doing my taxes and 
uh, my CPA at the time was like, what about your music stuff? I was like, she's like, you, any, anything, anything that you spend money on as a musician, you can write off. Uh, and we will definitely get into that. If any of you want, we have this on our webpage, but I'm happy to, you know, if you need a little bit more time, want to talk to me, um, I'm happy to give you what I started with. I have QuickBooks now, but I do have uh, an Excel sheet, super easy to break down. There's a green column, a red column, just keeps everything in line. And it just shows you at the end, this is what I spent on this stuff. This is what I spent on that stuff. So I'm, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, so that being said, register your project as a legal entity. The most simple way to do it is to go to LegalZoom. That's what I did. You can certainly, I don't know how PA works in Maryland. I can just go to the maryland.gov or it's like a business express page. You can go to irs.gov, get an EIN or an employee identification number. Uh, you could do an S Corp. I'm not a CPA. I'm not an attorney. Um, Pop Riot Music Group right now is an LLC and it's worked just fine. Uh, there are a lot of um, benefits to that. It's up to you to determine when the right time is, because I, I, in Maryland, I don't know how Pennsylvania is. E even though I don't own any uh, property, I still have to pay that $300 to tell them I don't own any property. I don't know how different PA is, but I find it to be worth it because of these, especially these. Uh, if something goes wrong and someone's like, that Athena, yeah, I'm gonna sue her. Well, you're not suing me, you know, social security number Athena. You're suing Pop Riot Music Group, which means my personal assets, my car, my this, my that, it's not in jeopardy. Um, it's only the business assets that are in jeopardy. So that, that for me, when I was told that, I'm like, yup, that's enough for me. Uh, there are other uh, advantages. Keeping a separate bank account also for me was a big deal. Uh, there are also benefits that I didn't really know until I uh, registered as an, uh, as an LLC. Like we talked about tax assistance and deductions, you can, anything that you spend your money on, if you, if all of us went to dinner and then we talked about music for 10 minutes, I could in essence write that entire thing off. Um, I think technically you're supposed to be like, well, what percentage of this dinner? But no one does that. Internships is another huge thing. When you're registered as a legal entity, a business entity, you can go to high schools and colleges and take on internships. The reason why this is beneficial to us is if, for example, you're like, I'm gonna do a radio campaign, I'm not gonna pay someone else to do it, I'll do it. You could take on an intern, whether you pay them or not is completely up to the financial health of your business. And you can say, okay, um, you're gonna put the mailers, you're gonna send it out, you're gonna basically do the things I don't wanna do. Um, I can't say for certain, I don't think you can do that officially as just you. So um, definitely take advantage of those because there are so many things that I say I'm gonna do, but I'm like, okay, I'm really tired. There's no way I can do it. But if you took on one or two interns that came in once a week, you know, twice a week to help you, there's so much that you can get done that you don't wanna do. Um, so. Is that a lot of life <laughs> yeah, well, mine uh, hates every. She's like, we, when we got married, she's like, we're not putting our, our accounts together because I don't want to see what you spend on music. So maybe you're the lucky one. <laughs> so yeah, no. Um, contracts. Now, again, when we have our longer form, I do go into a little bit more about the different contracts. Uh, anyone here have a band member agreement? Um, I am happy to send them to you. They are on the webpage if you decide to move forward. All of these are. Uh, the four really important ones, band member agreement, entertainment services contract, if you're um, performing, your band is performing, and someone needs you to provide a contract, uh, it's always, always good to have one because anything can happen. Like, let's say I own, uh, you know, Adam and I are, are putting on a festival and you have blocked off that time, right? When someone's paying you to perform, People think that they're paying you for the services rendered. Yeah, but you, they're also paying you for the fact that you have reserved that time for someone else. So there should be a clause in this contract that says if Adam and Athena don't, um, if they cancel the event after a certain amount of time, we still get paid. Because the idea is it's not about me not providing services to you. It's about now I can't get another gig. I have reserved this time for you. 
Now, if some places might provide the contract, in which case you can say, hey, what's the cancellation policy, and feel free to negotiate. But so many times I've walked into a, not a, not a venue like, you know, playing a gig, but any event, ha having nothing. And now that I have it, I'm like, I, what was I thinking? They could have easily done anything and not been obligated to compensate me for anything. Uh, release forms, if any of you are session musicians or use session musicians, this is a matter of protecting yourself. Uh, if you're a songwriter, you're protecting the ownership of your songs. It's potentially a lucrative um, route to go. We can certainly touch on that um, if we have time. Songwriting splits, and this is definitely something I do talk about, especially with bands. Songwriting, the legal definition of songwriting is lyrics, melody, and chord progression. Any drummers here? Sorry guys, womp womp. Um, I thought the joke would be that all of you would be drummers. <laughs> yeah, I like wake you guys up. Um, so the reason why I, I talk about songwriting is that if you're a drummer, you get the short end of the stick a lot of the times. Because how can someone argue that they own, you know, four on the floor or a simple beat, an intuitive yeah. beat? But I, I believe for sure that there's a way that you can argue that you can. Um, my two drummers, uh, they do have a hand in songwriting. We will put all the lyrics on there. And even if they don't change anything, there is an agreement in our band member agreement that unless a song is pulled in entirely finished and we don't feel it necessary to distribute songwriting credit based on uh, arrangement, everyone gets split a certain way. And there are so many ways you can do it. Uh, this is another topic where I could do an entire thing just on songwriting and syncing. Uh, but just do please keep in mind that um, what, you, what you claim as far as your songwriting allows you to get paid twice. When we go to a venue and play our music and we get our ticket percentages or our guarantees, we get paid as performers. But every single venue you play at, whether it's at a school, whether it's a bar, anytime you go to a bar and you hear music, that place is supposed to be paying a licensing fee to BMI, ASCAP, or any other performing rights organization. Anytime you go to a venue and play, uh, you should be getting paid as a songwriter through BMI or ASCAP. Does anyone have BMI or ASCAP? Oh man, you got, yeah, no, I'm, do not let me forget. Uh, it is so easy. And uh, for BMI, um, I know that you can register your shows six months prior. So if you have played shows and um, you haven't gotten paid for them as a songwriter, you have time to do it. Uh, it is worth doing because if you're in a situation where you have either sold a song to someone else or uh, you co-wrote a song and they're the ones performing it, you still get paid even if you don't perform it. Uh, there's a song that I did. I provided piano for uh, this rapper Sage Francis, his song Grace. And he was gracious, gave me 25% songwriting. He toured for two years straight across um, the UK and Europe. And for two years, I got royalties. I mean, and that, all you did, all I did was provide a little bit of, uh, of piano. So definitely, definitely, let's, let's go through that for sure. Um, how you split your songwriting directly affects how much money you get. And um, I will say that to, to sort of encourage two things. Don't just throw your percentage away. Um, you're not obligated to, if you wrote a song and you're bringing it to your band and you wrote the chords, the melody, and the lyrics, by legal definition, you have written the song. It doesn't matter what someone does to it. You know the song, Every Breath You Take, right? Sting owns 100% of that. But the part that we all know is, uh, okay, and Andy, forgot his name, the guitarist, is that guitar intro. That is the defining, yes, the defining part of that song. And yet he owns zero. He, I think he should have been given something, but Sting is Sting, even though he's awesome, he can be Sting. Um, so uh, how labels work, um, we go into tremendous detail on the webpage, but I'm going to go through this. Uh, I am not anti-label at all, uh, but it is important to look at a label as objectively as possible. The label is just a machine, a company, an entity that has different moving parts, different departments, and they're all working together to accomplish a common goal, which is to make money and to break an artist in a market. 
And in a weird way, we want them to make money because if they make money, they're still in business and they can help us. The more successful an artist gets in a market, where money both parties make. And um, I'm not saying that you should go and seek out getting signed, although if that's what you want, that's fantastic. But by looking at how labels work, we can see, okay, right now, since I'm the one doing it, what can I do to sort of mimic and scale down what uh, a label is doing? And before we dive into that uh, workflow, I very qu quickly want to go through and uh, define four key players that we will typically run into, a manager, agent, attorney, publicist. Uh, I know a lot of people that, that have managers and maybe about 40% of them are like, it's just a buddy of theirs that manages. Um, and the reason I bring this up in a course that says, you know, how to make money is we very are, we're quick to give a piece of the pie away, whether it's because we don't want to do it ourselves or because we're afraid to. Um, and you'll see in the next slide, there are important reasons why I say pump the brakes on the manager unless you really need it. A manager provides guidance and organization to an artist. That is the actual definition of a manager. In most states, they can't solicit you for, uh, for jobs. They can get you gigs because managers are typically really well networked. But really, an agent, like a booking agent or a representative in a you know, creative agency, they are, that's their job, is to arrange opportunities and negotiate deals. Their whole existence is, professional existence, is to get you in front of people that will hire you. Um, attorneys, pretty self-explanatory, they are there to review contracts, provide legal representation. A publicist, they are meant to lead campaigns that generate buzz and arrange interviews. <clears throat> now, agents and managers, like I said, are commonly used interchangeably, but they are not the same. And knowing the difference will allow you to save some money. Um, so an agent, by law, must work out of an office for a talent agency for the majority of, I think, most of the states. In most of the states, they have to be licensed. Or rather, be, yes, there has to be a license involved. They are typically limited to 10% commission. Of course, I'm sure there are other negotiations and um, terms that, that might make that more. Uh, your agent is likely going to have, like, bigger agents, you know, in CAA or uh, WME. 125 to 150 clients. Um, that is not, that's not too much because again, an agent's not holding your hand. They're not, um, you know, they're not guiding your daily workflow. Uh, so they don't have to talk to you all the time. They're there to get you gigs. A manager, on the other hand, does not have to, they can work from anywhere. They can work from their basement if they wanted to. Their commission is not legally restricted. Now, a good, I would say a really good percentage would be between 15 and 25. That's common. I have heard of uh, managers taking upwards of 50. So my question would be, if you're going to give someone a percentage of what you're getting, I know that when we start, we're like, oh, I'm getting, what's 25 out of 100? You know, that's $25. Yeah, but, you know, 50% out of a $1,000 gig, there goes $5,000. You know, could you have done that? So, is the money that you're giving a manager worth what you're getting? That's up to you. <laughs> There's a, a laugh in a It's just funny. Uh, I don't know, you know how, where everyone is musically. It's just funny thinking about it all. And where I'm, if I, uh, I'm in a death metal band. Sweet. We're, we're currently, it's called Murder Method. We play down in Baltimore and all around. Really? Yeah. Uh, Soundstage? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, Mostly the smaller venues around there. Uh, the guitarist wasn't Visceral Disgorge. Really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He, he was the bass player in that band. But uh, I'm just thinking, we're currently probably signing with uh, uh, Extreme uh, Management Group. Okay. Um, I don't know if you know anything about that. I don't really know that much about it. But, uh, yeah, the, you know, the other members of the band, they really wanted to do it. Obviously, we have to pay into it to do it. Mm, but, really? Uh, yeah, at the start. Um, Why? I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, we're a smaller band, you know, uh -huh. it's not like we're humongous, but uh, I don't know. I mean, we're, I told them, you know, we do this for a year, because it's like a year contract. Mm -hmm. As long as, you know, then we start really getting somewhere, then it makes sense. But I think after that, then they go to like a commission-based, you know, setup. Okay. But, uh, yeah, it's definitely a little weird. I never heard of doing anything yeah. like that, but, uh, I, yeah. You know, I, I don't want to misspeak. I, I, um... 
I don't know. I would I would suggest that any contract that you get before signing, take it to an attorney. Okay. Because, yeah, yeah it, and, and if the attorney charges you a fee, pay it. Because yeah. I, on the one hand, I understand in today's world, if, if they're taking a risk, they, you know, but on the other hand, it's like, if they're confident enough to sign you, which is probably the only reason why I would sign anyone, is that I'm confident I can do something yeah. with them. Why would I need them to pay me up front? Yeah. Unless I'm providing services that, you know, I, I just don't know. Yeah. It's a little uh, strange, but but not. Yeah, maybe. I, I can show, it's only like a seven-page contract. Yeah. It's not like that much, so I can maybe show you later, but there's something. Yeah, I mean, I. I, <laughs> so I you know. <laughs> I'm glad that that it. Uh, I will. I hope this helps. Yeah, th uh, this is completely random because I literally came in here for something like three hours ago, and he was really. Like, this is oh. so I was like, cool. Right, That's why awesome. Why not? <laughs> well, yeah, sweet. Was, so thank funny you. How it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's let's put a pin on that and come back to that. Mm -hmm. uh, a good manager will have under twenty clients. And quite frankly, maybe it's because I'm a little too granular with things. I don't know how a manager can have more than five really yeah and it's weird like again we work with three bands in pop riot and those three bands require the bandwidth of all of our people um so i would say if i had to prioritize one i would go with an agent and when we talk about necessary materials uh maybe we can sort of orchestrate a scenario where we can talk about the benefits of one because if this guy's job is to get you gigs then that's what we want but again manager is such a loose term that I don't want to yeah. misspeak and say eh, don't do it but then this guy could have been like the best connected dude um, so yeah general kind of guidelines when you would need them manager again going off of the written definition but again it's a super loose term Make sure your manager is actually providing something that you yourself can't do. Um, an agent, if you're looking for bigger gigs, more opportunities, auditions, etc., go, you go with an agent. An attorney, any time you have a contract that you're entering in, just go in. A publicist, if you want to get buzz, uh, I would do a PR campaign. I find them to be important because you're sort of establishing objective credibility. Like if I Google, what's your band name again? Murder Method. Murder Method. If I Google Murder Method, and the, you know the feds aren't on me for my Google search, yeah. Um, and, but I see that like all, oh wow, like all these outlets are writing about this band. I instantly am intrigued. I'm like, yeah. okay, cool, what's going on? So I'm not saying you always have to do a PR campaign, but it's I find that to be important um, because of that. Uh, a relationship with uh, a label is a partnership or however even an agent right there's a give and take there's a reason why they sh they should have a reason for wanting to sign you right yeah. and that's why these commission based jobs should be entered into because they they're like yeah I can make money off of that person and again we want them to but if I pay someone up front um, I'm not saying that they're not gonna do the work but that's it's a measurable amount now. You know, it's like it's like you hiring me to help you for five hours, yeah. as opposed to being like, "All right, Athena, here's a thousand dollars. Help me in this grand way." Yeah. We don't know how much it's going to take just yet. Yeah. Um, so that's my only sort of approach. Um, with anything, 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 what are you paying for? Uh, with labels, with any service providers, you are either, especially with labels, you are either paying back funds that have been given to you, which is like very traditional record label kind of thing. Um, or you are paying for the resources and the network of that established group or company or label. I would argue that at times uh, networking and connections are just as valuable as any, you know, tangible money. Like someone can walk in here and say, hey guys, here you go, $20,000 each for your career. And if we don't know what to do with that money, it's just as useless to us as if we didn't have it. Um, but now we're, we kind of know what we're going to do with it. Um, again, we, we go into this a lot more. Um, I'm happy to sort of go into it um, more afterward. We, as a label, have five major parts of what we do. Development, distribution, marketing, publicity, sales. And this is based off of what we saw a lot of our favorite, like we would look up our favorite bands 
you know, you know, big bands, small bands, whatever. And we would just see what label they have. You know, are they a subsidiary? And what do they do? And this is these are the five major things that they do. With development, is there cohesive branding tying the music and visuals to the story? You know, you might be very good, but maybe your 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 branding is not cohesive. Maybe your um, your narrative isn't as strong. Distribution, very simply, where is the music going? Is it every platform ever and then uh, you know record stores? Is it just one? And this we're gonna come back to when we talk about um, how to package our music. Uh, marketing, marketing is so massive, so important, uh, and so powerful. What campaigns will locate fans that will invest in the narrative, music, and products? How can we convert fans to customers? That's all marketing. Publicity, how can public awareness and interest be generated through press and interview? We talked about you know, being credible. And then sales, how can revenue be increased and sustained, sustained in multiple ways to ensure constant growth? Um, we, t you know, a little later in this presentation, we will talk about different kinds of uh, revenue streams, like active income, passive income. Uh, right now, we are all active. You know, we, we show up at a gig and we play. What I'd like to talk about is how we can establish multiple streams of different types of income. But first, I really want to talk about two naughty words that we, uh, I know you didn't know it was going to be that kind of a lecture. Um, we're not allowed to say them as musicians. We are shunned if we do. Shunned. <coughs> Bam. Fame and wealth. Fucked them up into flames. Um, I purposely use these words again and again and again to drive it home that they are not doo-doo words. Um, I like to kind of break them down into something manageable and tangible. Fame is just people knowing who you are. That's it. That's it. That's all it is. Whatever negative connotation, whatever is injected, inflamed, put in there, forget about it. Um, and if we're in the business of making fans, converting those fans, we want people to know who we are. So fame should be one of our goals. Fame is definitely something that we want. And what's great is that fame changes and blooms based off of our sample size, right? You guys might be famous in Lancaster, Central PA, Mid-Atlantic, United States, North America. And it's not an unheard of thing, right? Like, people become well-known. Uh, I just don't want you guys to be afraid of that word because so many of our peers are like, they only know how to speak in the hyperbolic. They're like, this is the worst monstrosity ever, or this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. I'm not in the business of that. Um, fame is people knowing who you are. Wealth is financial freedom. That's it. We are allowed and should want, we're allowed to and should want both. Which gets me into my absolute favorite thing to talk about, and that's stat goals. Um, how we set our goals dictates how and if we pursue them. And so we developed uh, a way to properly set these goals. If I said to everyone, hey, you know what? You guys have been great. You guys have been great. Thank you so much. Um, let's go back to my place. All right, let's go. And I get in my car and I go. What then? Well, you know I'm in Maryland. So you're going to drive south, hopefully. And uh, all right, so you're like, all right, I'm in Maryland. What do I do? Well, I'm in Ellicott City. OK, well, then you go a little bit further. At some point, you're still gonna know what? You need to know what? My address. You need to know my address. Otherwise, if you don't know where I live and you get in the car and go, you're burning resources. And so what we do as musicians, we're saying, I want that. I want that. And we get in the car and we go and we have no idea where we're going. We just see that shining beacon and we burn our resources. We get tired and we're like, you know what? I'm just gonna go home. And all we need to know is exactly where to go. And so that's why uh, properly setting goals is so important. Uh, I'm gonna share with you my initial goals before I did any of this. I wanted to be successful at music. I wanted to make money from my music. I wanted to make a difference in someone's life and I wanted to own a record label. Technically, I've, I've done these things. I, I'm, I'm happy um, where I am with music and my trajectory. I've made money from my musical endeavors. I have been fortunate enough to be told that I've made a difference in someone's life through my music, and I own Pop Riot Music Group. 
but do I, did I really get what I want? Like, I mean, if I achieved all this, why am I even here? You know, why, what else am I pursuing? The truth is that I needed to be way more specific uh, than this. So this is where the stack goals come in. Again, I said I'm a massive, massive fan of video games. And a lot of the games that I play, um, tabletop games and video, they have, they typically have three gauges, right? There's heart, stamina, and magic. And so if we were to convert those into our sort of day to day, um, uh, we would say the heart is growth, stamina is experience, magic is contribution. And so uh, I just wanna dive into that a little bit more. Heart is all about you. Like in these games, it's like your heart, your life force, uh, your qualities, your education, yourself. It's just all about you. And so the way that I like to frame this question is when you think of your finale, your music career, you are standing, you, you have achieved. How do you see yourself? What type of performer are you? Uh, if someone was interviewed and they had worked with you, what are they going to say about you? And how do your fans describe you? And notice, I'm not saying this in the future tense. What performer would you be? Because it is proven that if we think of ourselves, if we think of our, our ideal self in the present tense, we act differently. We approach our projects and our problems differently. Uh, I also like to phrase this question in um, y using non-musical related questions. How many languages do you speak? How is your health? How do you feel? What do your friends say about you? And my personal favorite, what three words would you describe in, uh, what three words would describe yourself in your final form? And uh, you might be asking like, again, why is she doing this? My three words um, are brave, honest, and deliberate. And I can say with 100% certainty that since implementing this, and I do this on a yearly basis, I'll go back and like revisit my stat goals. Um, I have approached communication, getting my band gigs uh, in a much more uh, productive way, knowing that I wanna be brave, honest, and deliberate. I have walked away from deals that were not set up to be beneficial in the long term, uh, even though I really, really wanted the thing. Uh, it's not just about what we want, it's how we want it. Uh, stamina uh, is, uh, I just did that. Stamina is about experience, right? And our prompt is uh, in that final form, uh, what have you done and accomplished? This is my favorite one to do, because it's where we get to like let loose um, and just think about all the things that make us salivate. Like, where have we played? regionally, globally? What size venues do you sell out? You know, are you the type of person that really likes intimate smaller venues? Do you want to play arenas? Um, how many, did you win any awards? Maybe a Grammy, et cetera, et cetera. And then again, non-musically, how many houses do you own? One, two, four, where are they? Are all, they're all in Lancaster? Uh, are they like globally? Do you have any collections? What else are you known for? The reason why I bring this up, again, it's not to be frilly, as musicians, there has never been a point in modern music, in, in the modern industry where a musician has made money off of just one thing. You know, you, you get people that tour all the time, but again, that's one source of income. A lot of our most successful musicians make money in multiple ways. Their merch, their, you know, their, their um, music, their contributions and donations. But a lot of really successful entrepreneurs, musicians, artists, they also have other ventures. Now, I decided two years ago when we were knee deep in this information that I was gonna start writing a book and I actually finished it a couple months ago. It's about what the Legend of Zelda teaches us about being successful entrepreneurs. It's called A Link to Success. And <laughs> yeah, I can't take credit for that. That was all my life. Um, the, the reason I bring that up is because being able to, in an authentic and genuine way, represent ourselves in other fields allows us to feed into our music and establishes yet another way to make money so that our music isn't depending on those crappy gigs that we don't want to play. So please, please, please don't be afraid to fill this out. And, and if anyone is interested, well, I'm going to get your emails before you leave. I am going to send you uh, a synopsis of this and also some worksheets as well. Uh, and the last thing, music, uh, magic, and contribution, this is all about your community, right? What you give back. 
And so when we write our uh, contribution goals, what is your legacy? What will people say about you and your art? How have your music or you changed someone's life? And of course, non-musically, what can you do that'll brighten up someone's day today? How can you be an example of someone that helps while still exercising boundaries? The reason I'd like to talk about impact, and let's put it in a way that we're all gonna understand. As musicians, whether we're talking locally, regionally, globally, it's really easy to stand out because musicians tend to be, uh, well, let's just use an example. I own a venue and I say, load in is at six. Fans are gonna show up when? 6.15, 6.30. Yeah. <laughs> our, our band always shows up five minutes early. We load in, we ask, I mean, we are like, we shake hands. The first person I shake hands with is the sound guy. And it's a little sad, but also cool. Venues remember us for being punctual and for being attentive and kind. Um, so I have worked with sound guys that have been pissed at other bands. But they, like, because we were so helpful to them, they've added like a little bit of extra delay, a little bit of extra reverb, and for them it's like dry vocal signal and it's like not meant to be dry. It is unfortunate yet beneficial that it is so easy to stand out as a musician. Uh, so it is not too early to be known for being kind, for being, like, and not saying, you know, roll over and not stand up for yourself, but there is a difference between being kind and then being um, and being a pushover. We don't want to be pushovers. Um, when you approach goal setting from a place of emotion and feeling, you are mo more likely to not only achieve your goals, but to also want to surpass them. And so here is why I talk about stat goals. I'm going to share mine with you. Uh, let me know if you cannot read that. Uh, it doesn't look good. Yeah, let me, can I? Ooh, that wasn't good. Doesn't look like I can zoom in. Well, I, I will read some. So heart, to always be a genuine leader, constantly practice and improve my craft, um, quadrilingual daily meditations, under stamina. You know, I wrote be a successful public speaker, tour Europe and the UK with prism waves uh, and magic. You know, I've, I've, um, I've written a few things down. Now, I want to point out two of them. And I promise it'll all make sense. Under stamina, it says, uh, have Kristen Stewart direct a music video. Uh, random, I know, it seems random, right? Now, we all have that one goal, right? That one goal that doesn't make sense to everyone else. You feel sheepish saying it out loud. Uh, I'm a fan of Kristen Stewart, not all of her, you know, stuff, like not the Twilight stuff, but I think she's a great artist uh, with great style, and especially the stuff she's directed. Um, everything that I need to do to put myself in a position uh, where I am prepared to email her team is stuff I already have to do, right? You can't force someone to say yes, but you can at least make sure that all of how you present yourself is at a high quality. So if I wanted to reach out to Kristen Stewart's team, what do you think I would need to up my chances for her to even remotely take me seriously? Name recognition. Name recognition, okay. So a little bit of credibility like maybe some high quality music. Yeah, professional. Yeah, yeah portfolio. music videos. Portfolio. Portfolio, how about like, I need to have good metrics on my YouTube and, and Spotify. So we already need to do that. We already need to have high quality stuff. We need to have fans, we need to have views. But now we've got this crazy, crazy goal that excites you as an individual. And we're gonna be like, no, no, no. We're gonna, we're gonna really push it, you know? So that's why we have this exercise because it's very easy to be like, all right, I got to get my socials up. All right, cool. I'm going to get my socials up. And if you don't know why you're doing it, then it gets a little stale. And that's why people get burnt out on socials. Um, so when I send you this worksheet, don't be afraid to, to do it. Do it for yourself. Do it for your band. You know, if one of your goals is to, you know, tour with Muse, Write that down, they're humans. I mean, Queens of the Stone Age picked up Royal Blood. I remember when Royal Blood played the auto bar to like 20 people. So, and that wasn't too far off of when they toured with Queens of the Stone Age, it was like three, four years. A lot can happen in a short amount of time. 
And also, um, magic, under magic, I actually have donated $100,000 to the Lancaster Farm Sanctuary. I love that place. I try to go there twice a year. I think the owners are great. I think what they're doing is great. Um, the reason why I point that out is in order to comfortably donate $100,000, you need a lot more than $100,000. So that goal, in addition to other goals, implies wealth. We're not saying, I want to be a millionaire, even though it's very clear that that's the goal. Now we're putting reasoning behind it. Now, if someone were to say, oh, why do you have money as your goal, which I do get sometimes, I'm like, well, because I want to donate to these people, because I want to, you know, uh, how, it's always been a, you guys remember those old like Japanese game shows where they have to like not laugh in the library? You guys remember those? I really want to recreate that and have it be this like fundraiser to like, well, I have a few on my list. We won't go into that. This is so incredibly important for your fundamentals and your foundation uh, because it takes the mundane, it takes the tedious, and it makes it something that you're excited about. Um, and one thing you'll find as you go through your, um, your sack goals is that you're gonna start to see an above all else goal. As musicians, we want multiple things. It's easy for us to be like, yeah, I want a tour, and I want my music on TV, and I want this, and I want that. The truth is, is that unless we've got infinite resources, which we don't, we're gonna have to choose what we prefer. Would you rather tour the world to fans, you know, that know your music, playing 200 capacity venues, or would you rather have a song on the next Stranger Things equivalent? They're both incredibly enticing and awesome, but they require different things. They require different, you know, focuses. And unless we have the, the funds to be able to do both equally, we will inadvertently need to remind ourselves of what the above all else goal is. Um, so let's start to, to really dive into some tangibles. Successful career in music is one with multiple streams of different types of income. Um, for those who don't know, active income is like press button, receive bacon. You physically perform an action, you get paid. You do lessons, you get paid. You play a gig, you get paid. Passive income is continuous income that is without much ongoing effort. So for example, we spent four years doing these courses and filming them, and now we put them online. The idea is, okay, cool. People are gonna go to these lectures, they're gonna potentially like it, and they're gonna buy it. I don't have to show up to give the lecture every time someone purchases. So each and every one of you has something that you can do as far as both active income and passive income. So this is a, a, a obviously a very condensed list that we're going to return to. Um, I am definitely going to go over. I can speed up. Uh, does anyone have to leave at 430? All right. I will. I knew it. I will definitely do my best to, to get through all of this. Um, gigs, both live and streaming, um, you know, of course, we, we, we talk about tickets and uh, guarantees, but there are others like, who here has played a local show and had a donation box? I haven't either. You have? Right. No, never mind. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, why haven't we done that? I've never done that. And, like, we were putting this together and, like, interviewing people, and someone said, oh, yeah, I have it right in my, uh, my merch booth. And I'm like, I never thought of doing that. You know, and there are ways, you know, you can start to get into the, the granular stuff. Like, if you're selling a, a t-shirt for $21 instead of 20 now a lot of people don't, they might not do cash, but if they do, and you have sort of a funky number, you're going to have to give change, right? You're going to give four ones. So someone might take that, you know, four ones and go, yeah, okay, we just made an extra $4. Or if in your POS system you have, would you like to tip, you know, 20%, whatever, the worst that they're gonna do is click no, but they might out of habit or because they want to click, yeah, 15%. Uh, and that stuff adds up. Merch and apparel is for me the most important. It's the one I'm going to hammer home uh, when we get to that section. Music streams and sales, I can go on about streaming. Um, I'm happy to sort of express my thoughts on it. Syncing in royalties for those of you who want to go into songwriting or for those of you who do um, want to explore uh, ways to market your music to appropriate uh, outlets. Like, for example, you're in a metal band. Yeah. Uh, you're probably not going to get your song on, uh, like, a romantic comedy, right? Maybe, if there's a big breakup. Probably <laughs> you're going to get it on sports, you know, like extreme sports, 
uh, hockey. wrestling, hockey. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. but there are outlets there. And if you yeah. think about it, you're like, yeah, actually, I do see it in wrestling and this and that. So now you have an avenue that maybe you didn't think of before. Uh, and if you're stuck, you've got a nice hook. And one thing I will say about songwriting, if you guys are pursuing songwriting and syncing, have multiple versions of your song. At least, at the very least, have a regular version of your song and then an instrumental. Because there are people that will take the song as an instrumental, you know, bring it down and then there's talking or, or whatever. And they might not take it if there are vocals because there might be conflicting, you know, people hear words. Um, Membership income, for those of us who have established some bit of support and fan base, having a Patreon, or if you want to build it within your own web page, uh, that is so lucrative if you do it right. Uh, my guitarist's previous band had a Patreon. They were making two grand a month. And, I mean, that was in addition to everything else that they had. And they had set this thing up airtight. Um, and then, not necessarily lessons. Some of you may be like, nope, I'm not going to do that. but. If you are a specific type of drummer, guitarist, whatever, you've got a style. I mean, we just, again, flip on Instagram and you just see, you know, there's an Italian guy. I think there might be two Italian drummers that just play freakishly fast. And that's their whole shtick. And that's, they, they kind of blew up. So if there's anything that you have that tends to be of interest to people, a fill that you play or a song that everyone loves, you can use that to, you know, you can give it away as an incentive or you can sell it, you know? Throw up your tabs, throw up your, your lessons for a dollar, two dollars, a digital download, and you never know. If you set up your e-commerce the right way, we do have a whole thing where we, we run through how to effectively set up a profitable online store. Uh, there, are, um, there are upcharge sales that you can do where someone puts something in their cart, they go to checkout, and right before the checkout they go, hey, do you want to add these tabs for just a dollar? They might say yes, they might say no. And if they do, you just upped an extra dollar. And if you do digital stuff, digital tabs, they don't really cost you anything but time. Uh, so that's a way to increase um, profitability. Um, I want to talk branding, but I am admittedly going to go through a little bit quickly. Branding, very simply, how you as a musician present and represent your music and identity through distinctive, consistent, and cohesive design. Uh, if marketing is getting people to say yes, then branding is increasing the likelihood of getting that yes. And the way that we do that is through a method we call pocket aces. And uh, pocket aces is a method we use. It's a, uh, we use non-musical descriptions to basically relate and identify a project for anything, whether it's creating our necessary materials, branding, etc. And so pocket aces is simply action setting emotion scene what do you imagine someone doing while listening to your music are they you know on a motorcycle going 100 miles an hour are they crying in the fetal position are they driving at night with the top with the top down uh, all those actions not only elicit uh, a response from us but it already starts to present a certain color palette or a certain feeling uh, setting what's the environment like what season is it time of day weather if we wrote a song and it's the perfect driving song, all right, well, are we driving at night or in the morning or in the afternoon? They all feel different, right? Is it summer? Is it winter? Uh, you know, a summer setting, I can already see the colors. Winter setting are a bit more muted. So that informs potentially our gear. And when the song takes place, like, you know, if it's a very wintry song, I'm probably not gonna put out some tank tops or crop tops. I'm probably going to prioritize your beanies, your, your hoodies. Emotion, what are they feeling while listening to it? What caused the emotion? And then my favorite is scene. If this song was on a TV show or movie, what kind of scene would it be? If you're doing like post-industrial, like Pussifer, Nine Inch Nails, you know, I would be thinking, all right, cool. Like under, what is it, under, Underworld? The one with, yeah, uh, yeah that type of thing. Got the, uh, got the people listening in. <laughs> listening to me, man. Um, so that is an exercise that I really like. Uh, I, we can do this very quickly. Uh, if we were on an indie band that just wrote a summer banger, the song is upbeat and flirts with a, some funk undertones. You can already kind of hear that song. Like think of like Mark Ronson, Uptown Funk. Um, we already start to think about, okay, actions, 
beach, driving, we start to paint that picture. So I would suggest that you guys listen to some of your songs, listen to your, your band as a whole and also individual tracks because what you're able to come up with as far as your pocket aces informs um, different materials and approaches to stuff like music videos. Um, it also can influ influence and impact show experience. So this is uh, Prism Wave's uh, cover art for Monster, our single. It's got a lot of vibrant color, it's bold, colors against white, and it mimics a prism. So we used this, reflected this in our lights. So as you can see, this is a show we played at Metro Gallery. Uh, we use it here and I will play um, sort of a video representation of that. This we've used in a number of different ads. Oh, cool. Oh, we don't have speakers, do we? Good question. I can oh. turn off the TV if it, yeah. Oh, know. sorry about that. Uh, I should have, uh, that's my fault. I should have. Uh... Right this is. Oh. Maybe. Ooh. Is it playing? Oh, I, no, I can not Okay. Sweet. Let's see what's up. Should be pretty good. Oh, yeah. That was my fault. Here we go. Thank you. So, yeah, you can see every slide has a vibrant color. pairs well together. Okay. Uh, and all that came from um, all that came from one reference. Uh, so our crew, our, our merch crew actually did the same thing. So not the best picture, my apologies, uh, but uh, Shay actually used the album art as inspiration. So if we got a close up of her eye, uh, her eyeshadow mimicked that cover art. She said, my goal was to reflect the band's art in my own way through my makeup. As a part of the team, I am a part of the band's branding. Um, the other thing that a good pocket aces strategy informs is the necessary materials. Anyone can put together a one sheet. Anyone can put together a, an EPK, but how it stands out, that's what matters. Um, so we are at 418, keep going. These are the necessary materials that I recommend that every musician has, despite the level, bio, one sheet, EPK, video press kit, also a VPK, official web page, music video. <clears throat> we do two types of bios. We have a short form bio and a long form bio. Uh, short form is perfect for like emails, press releases. I love how punchy it is, emotive. And of course your long form bio is perfect for, I'm gonna go ahead and get, um, send this to a booking agent. And so now I can be a bit more specific and a bit more informative and curate it for that person. Uh, so I'm gonna give you an example of uh, the short form bio and this is kind of doubled as the first paragraph of the long form bio for uh, my other band, Circuit Villains. <clears throat> Circuit Villains is the friend that shows up to the party, kicks down the damn door and makes sure their presence is known. Grab a drink and move your hips because their sound is an unapologetic slap in the face of tight grooves, unique tones, and brash vocals. Whether on or off stage, the band's attitude is laced within every song, making sure you have the perfect soundtrack to strut to. I favor bold, intriguing, short form bios. Um, what I love about them is that when paired with a video press kit, which you will see, I am, I am convinced that that alone, that pairing alone has made so many doors open for us. Um, if, I, if you were a booking agent and you had to guess what that song, what this band sounds like, what would you say? Unapologetic slap in the face of tight grooves, unique tones and brash vocals. Like alternative kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I like is that it's the perfect soundtrack to strut to. When you think of someone strutting, it's a specific type of walk. It has confidence, it has a bunch of it. So again, when I show you our video press kit, you will see that that pairing in and of itself has completely represented this band accurately to someone like a booking agent. Uh, my recommendation for writing a good bio, 
Always reference your pocket aces. Some uh, non-musical descriptions will always pique people's interest. Keep it relevant and ensure it always serves you. You're not serving yourself if you tell someone all the band members that you went through. No one needs a chronological recap of, you know, this person didn't work out or that person didn't work out. It, you want this bio to be informative and intriguing. It, amongst, amongst the sea of bios that people are reading, you want it to stand out and you want it to, to paint a favorable picture for you. Any, anything, like change and specifically the removal of something or someone always seems a bit unstable. Adding something doesn't so much seem unstable. So showing someone that you've had, oh, well, we started off with this person and that person, they might look at it and go, okay, well, what's, why? Why do I know now that they went through 13 drummers? Um, your one sheets and your EPK, they're going to have your bio. They're also going to have photos, your achievements, if you sold out a local show or, or anything like that, it got an award, releases, social links, contact info, and the great thing is that you can make it stand out with your branding. Uh, an EPK is more detailed, is a more detailed and informative version of your one sheet. Your one sheet is essentially it's one page, usually PDF format. It's if it's really nicely branded, it will really pop. And it has a quote, a bio, it's very digestible. Your EPK is more involved. It includes music, video. You can make it a part of your web page, like, you know, circuitvillains.com slash EPK. You can just send that link. There are third-party sites like but Reverb Nation does it, Bandzoogle does it. Just weigh out the pros and cons uh, is what you have, is what you want to say limited by what the third-party offers. Um, and if, it, if you want it to stand out, is your uh, web page going to give you that freedom to do that? If you had to only do one thing other than a good bio or one sheet, this video press kit, in my opinion, the most important marketing material you can have, point blank, and I will show you why. So this is Circuit Villain's video press kit. <sighs> My So if you were a booking agent, what would you, what can you tell from this BBK about this band? High quality. High quality? It's good. Cool, thank you. Dope. <laughs> I wish I could clap for you, but. I know, we're not allowed. <laughs> if you have a cricket sound, that'd be really effective. <laughs> that'd be um, yeah, I mean, if I were a booking agent, I would look at that and go, wow, they, they bring a lot of people, and those people are really into it. They're energetic. They invest in their light show. Um, if I were a booking agent, I would also find that that annoying short-form bio that I rolled my eyes at, oh, they meant it. They meant every word. Um, there's aggressiveness, there's attitude, and uh, I'm, I will only show to a certain point, I just wanna show. Like, we've got crowd shots here. Here. That is what's important. Whoop. There was a thing a little bit ago, some opening pop artists or something, but they had like, they photoshopped like extra people in the crowd to make it look cooler. Mm -hmm. And but someone called them out on it. It was like, a big thing, it was funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Photoshop is amazing. My Photoshop skills are so bad, I'm better off just doing like a little stick figure. <laughs> um, but the thing also is we happen to be, pl this was filmed over the course of a few months because we didn't have all the material. You know, one thing I've done a long time ago is we needed a press kit but we weren't playing any shows. So we rented a space that had a stage and we just brought 40 people. I mean, we told the guy about it. And we, we simulated a show. And we joined that coverage, uh, those clips with actual 
you know, shows that <coughs> this alone has gotten us so many gigs. And this, it's not even 45 seconds. I think it's like 42 seconds. We've used it as ad, at like um, ad assets. We have made fans, I mean, it's, it's unlike what I've seen typically. Um, people really responded well to it. Uh, so if you're working with a videographer, like this cost me six, $600, you know, it included everything, all the setup, edit. But when you work with a videographer or you yourself know how to pace everything, there isn't a time where I get bored. And I, I mean, I don't mean this to sound ridiculous. Like I'm so happy this is my man. Like I look at it and I'm like, oh, I can't believe this is us. Cause the pacing is so good. Um, so if you were to invest in one thing, that, um, and it just does what the written word can't do, right? Uh, and if you are someone who also like is a producer or also does songwriting, you can do a separate video press kit just for that. You guys see those ads where it's like Charlie Puth and he's like, you know, showing you some studio stuff and there's always some slow motion nod like, yeah, this is cool. It works <laughs> though, right? It's cool. Um, so being able, we're in a digital world, obviously we want to not think too hard um, and no one likes mystery anymore. So we, the best way we can represent ourselves in a short amount of time is a video press kit. Notice also that in the press kit, the video press kit, I didn't put any words, nothing. The only thing that you saw was the, um, the logo on the, on the corner right, uh, the bottom right hand corner and also um, at the end. And I like that because it looks crisper, cleaner, um, and also you can repurpose it as an ad. So you kind of, you know, you get a lot more for your money. Uh, I am in favor of having a web page, an official web page. It looks professional. It allows you to um, curate it as far as design, to layout, function. You know, right now we have um, a one page for each of our bands on Wix. Right? There's video in the background. In fact, I could probably show you, I'm not gonna take up time. I will show you ours. Now, we are launching a store soon, and what we're gonna do is uh, expand on the web page to include a store. I love that about web pages that you can scale as you grow. Or, you know, a lot of bands from the 90s, it's, it's unfortunate that so many modern bands don't do it, but like, I remember going to a band's webpage and just being intrigued. Like Tool used to do it, Pussifer, actually Pussifer is a good example of a band that still does it, Queens of the Stone Age. You go there and it's just a, a completely unique experience. It's not just uh, EPK style, which is perfectly fine. Mine is an EPK style. But my goal would be to have it have uh, a unique experience that you can't find on Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Um, those social sites, they're, um, they're gonna pass, they always do. TikTok's the big thing right now. In three years, there's gonna be something else. And every single time there's a new one, people are gonna be like, if you wanna be big, you gotta get on these platforms. Sure, you remember, uh, has, was anyone like doing music during the MySpace day, right? No? Yeah. All right, yeah. all right, cool, cool. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So I remember when people would like pay someone to be like, can you design my MySpace? <laughs> and then it moved to Facebook and you just now have this useless page that no one cares about. And then of course you have Facebook, they don't allow any design work. So your .com, you can funnel people to it. The great thing about it is you have control over that data. If you install a pixel, which is something we definitely get into um, on, in the uh, course, you can see who does what. They're called uh, event pixels, I believe that's what they're called. You know, they, you will have uh, a data of who visited the site. If they put something on the cart and they didn't buy it, it's called abandoning the cart, you'll know who did that. I mean, they won't give you their names, but you'll have the data to be able to send them an email or create customer lists from them. Um, social media platforms don't have that, right? Your web page is not a slave to the next trend, right? You have the freedom to create something else, which I think is very, very important. Um, and also, if you're gonna start with one thing, please buy your domain. Uh, just, to, you know, pretend you're a booking agent, right? Which looks more professional? This or that? And this is not our thing, but it's like, hey, go to our webpage, facebook.com, Prison Waves the Band, Maryland 1A. You've lost it. Um, so you, uh, 
it is worth the very little money that it that it uh, costs to, to buy your domain. And at the very least, you can now redirect it to your socials. It's just much easier to say to someone, hey, go to circuitvillains.com. Uh, a music video, one professional music video is more effective and important than five poorly made ones and poorly sounding ones. Now, when I say poorly made, I do not mean crisp versus you know, DIY, I mean appropriate. And the best way I can describe it is by just throwing our fans under the bus. So I will pay, play just a few seconds of Prism Waves Monster, and then I will compare it to Red Valley Nursery. Compare it to another artist of Pop Rise called Red Valley Nursery. different music videos, right? You've got something that's a bit more crisp, polished, you get something gritty, but they work, right? They don't look, it's not a matter of one's better than the other, because they are perfectly um, matched with the branding of the band. Uh, you know, Red Valley Nursery is your sort of like, has a little bit of punk elements, stoner rock. So it's got, um, it's got a certain appeal that is successfully represented in that music video. So it doesn't, um, it's not doing you any favors to set up an iPhone, not edit it. I'm not saying that iPhones can't make good videos, they can. To not invest in something that reflects you know, your story and your narrative. One successful music video, you can promote this for years, 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 years. Um, so I would most certainly, ooh, sorry about that, don't do that. I would most certainly focus on that. And the reason why I go through these necessary materials is because we use them a lot when we book gigs. And um, the booking process, in my opinion, the way that I've seen it and done it, can be broken down into three simple parts. Research, execution, follow-up. Especially if you're going out uh, into a different market. Uh, you know, our initial questions, what type of show do you want to play? Do you want to hop on a show that with an established lineup or build a lineup from scratch? And then how many people do you anticipate coming versus the venue's capacity? You know, when we talk about types of shows, we're talking about location, you know, is it a local show, touring, national, uh, is it your market or is it a new market? Um, I have found, so Circuit Villains, we did a show, we were asked to do sort of a stripped show, and we were like, this is not us, this is going to be terrible, uh, but we said yes anyway. Um, and what's interesting is that we got a version of Spear Gun Love, the song that you heard uh, in the BBK, 
in a format we didn't think we would ever do. So I will uh, play a few moments of that, and it yielded an actual uh, uh, good outlet for us. So here's... my tone, my pitch was off, it's all right. Um, and so what ended up happening is here we are, a hard rock band, and we're like, actually, that doesn't sound too bad. We ended up um, creating a version of it, which we're gonna be releasing as a separate product, and we're not going to make it available on Spotify. This is going to be available just for people that want it. We're still gonna promote it, uh, but it's actually going to be pushed we may just put this song on Spotify, and then all the other songs we only make available during our uh, on our on our web page. But I'll just play you a few moments of this. This is what it sort of yielded to. You get sick of the song after a while. This a banger. Thank you. <laughs> because you never know what type of, I mean, I don't know how, how successful your no, uh, yeah, no. acoustic, <laughs> actually you could do like math rock, but no. Um, as far as establishing lineups or building it yourself, there are pros and cons to both. If a lineup is already established, there's less for you to do, but you don't have as much control. You might not know the bands, although this would be perfect um, to do if you're going outside of uh, a market. Um, if you're building it yourself, you have more control, but there's a lot of work and responsibility on your shoulders. Um, now, when I talk about people coming to a venue versus um, the venue's capacity, it's not about whether or not you can bring people. It's about a strategy of perception, right? Um, if I fill a room, if I fill a room that's 250 capacity, like Metro Gallery is one of my favorite places to play. It's a 250 capacity room. Uh, soundstage is a thousand when it's totally open, 500 half. Now, t Metro Gallery packed and sold out is more memorable than soundstage with 600 people. Why? Because they're all spread out. Uh, there's less of a risk involved with smaller venues and I just keep thinking, man, people are gonna remember a sweaty time. They're gonna remember like, oh, did you go to that show? It was so packed. Now there are technically more people at the Soundstage show, but they didn't have, our, you know, our proximity wasn't included in that. Uh, so something to keep in mind. Um, basic approaches, you know, sort of common sense, but some of them maybe missed. Google search live venues plus city. You cannot go wrong with that. You can do the same thing with festivals. Um, I like going to a venue's calendar and going through and seeing who's playing. If there's a national that's on, I don't know how it works here in Baltimore. Uh, if there's a national that's on and I see that it's TBA as far as their guests, I'll send an email to the venue. Sometimes it works. Sometimes they, you know, they already have it filled. 
Um, I also like using the related pages feature on Instagram and also IndieOnTheMove.com. Uh, that, that has been around for over a decade and it's still super valuable uh, because you know you, if you're touring and you're looking at different venues you can at least start there and then try to talk to people in that area. But this is what I use with Instagram as far as uh, you know everyone's using Instagram what information can we get from it to help us? Let me try to do this. So, as you can see, I'm on Metro Gallery's Instagram page. Uh, this button right here, little plus sign, will pull up suggested. So if I go to Union Stage, which is a venue in DC, again, I press that button, and Instagram will show me related artists. So again, I press that button, everything comes down. I not only find different venues, I find events, I find um, booking agents. So I think here we went to the Rams had a lot on stage. I think that might be in Anne Arundel County. But same thing, you press that button. Now you get a uh, Capital Gazette is a news, um, newspaper. So you can start to acquire all of these um, bits of information to help you. So this, uh, you know, we, we clicked on their web page, and um, if we go to menu, contact, almost every venue, every venue should have contact information. You know, you get the basic stuff right here, but here we have artist booking. So they give you information on how to book. Now again, you go through their calendar, you kind of see what they're booking, who's playing. Um, it takes research, it takes time, but it is um, very, very helpful. And surprisingly, not something that a lot of bands do. Um, it takes, like, set aside two or three hours to just do this. It, again, it's, it's something that will eat a lot of your time, but you will amass a lot of information, and it's super valuable. Uh, now about show swapping, I'm not sure if any of you did any show swapping. There's a lot of risk there. Uh, anyone can say, yeah, man, I'll get you to a packed show. Uh, I remember I swapped a show with a band in Philly. <clears throat> brought them to a sold out CD release at the Metro Gallery and they actually dropped the show they were supposed to play. It was uh, pretty much a disaster. But it happens. Um, so learning from that experience, we solely depended on their pool to bring people, right? Or the, you know, the other bands in that uh, lineup. There are ways that you can run your ads where you could um, gain fans in a specific market. It takes time. The likelihood of someone seeing your band and in two weeks wanting to go to a show, not unheard of, but not as guaranteed as it would take for me to feel comfortable putting my money towards it. I would want a little bit more time to, um, to run those ads and acquire good data. Uh, follow through, if you're offering a show swap and you say, hey, I can get you into a show in Baltimore, do it. Uh, or if you can't have a backup plan, if they're going to go on tour during a time where you can't play, you know, tell them, hey, if I can't do it, I will put you in contact with someone who can. Because then at that point, you have, you have done good by what you said. If you, if you pretty much say, I will get you a show and you can't, uh, that's where things get a little sour. When you do reach out to venues, do research. Uh, are there any rules, preferences uh, that are listed on the web page? Like if someone says, don't send an attached e uh, MP3, don't send an attached e MP3. My recommendation, once again, one sheet and video press kit. That's pretty much all you really need. Um, the body of your email should be informative and concise. Um, you know, keep it short, but keep it informative. Uh, here's how I recommend doing your, your um, subject. Booking, whatever your name is, if you have representation, hyphen date range. So booking Red Valley Nursery, Hop Right Music Group September September uh, 1st through 4th. If <clears throat> Red Valley did not have representation, that's how it would look here. Uh, if you are representing yourself, this is how I recommend writing it. This is Athena from Pop Right Music Group representing Prism Waves as both management and member. And the reason why I like that is because in that sentence it has established that I'm the person that you talk to that I am the manager, and that you are to take me seriously, there's a matter of per, per, um, professionalism. Um, 
I try to write my emails in a very professional way, but also human. I'm not purposely writing in legalese. Um, but I'm also not being, um, I'm establishing that I'm expecting professionalism by being professional. It's also a way that a bands can stand out as well. Um, don't lie, please, 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 please. If you tell a booking agent or a venue, uh, hey, I can, uh, I can bring 100 people, and you bring 20, uh, of course, everyone has bad days, and booking agents know that, but um, it's not a good look. You can say, what I like to do is to under-promise under and overachieve. Hey, for this particular night, I'm looking between 75 and 100 people, if I know that I can bring 150. Uh, that way, um, I've gone above what they've expected, uh, which also helps because they're impressed, and that's a great feeling. Um, so as music as a product, um, we talked earlier about how we are in the business of something beautiful and transcendent. Like, you can take a, a, a song in D minor uh, and play it for anyone, uh, especially you know some of those old classical pieces that we don't just listen to for fun. Uh, play it anywhere, anytime. You're still going to feel the weight of that song. Um, like we said earlier, we can't package and sell that feeling. We can't do it, um, and. It really, for me, makes me question, is music the product? Uh, I, I think it still can be, but it requires us to hold back, and that's really because of streaming. Um, streaming works the, like Spotify works the exact same way Amazon Prime does, right? It, in the contract for Amazon Prime, say, so I, my favorite movie of all time is Aliens. So I bought a copy of Aliens. I have a DVD, I have this, I have that, I have it on Amazon Prime. I spent, what is it, $17 on it. If I were to get rid of Amazon Prime, I wouldn't have that copy of Aliens. And you would think, well, I bought it. No. Technically, you have purchased a blanket license that allows you to indefinitely watch that movie in that platform. So you don't really own it. And the reason I bring this up is Spotify, Apple, it's all the same. If all of us lost Spotify right now, when bank bankrupt, they shut it down. Would you be able to find every song that you saved, recreate your playlist? I mean, I remember when I, I knew every CD that I had. So there is something to purchasing and owning and investing in. Um, the reason I bring that up, and this is my opinion, and I do like to separate what my opinion is, streaming is important for discovery, right? I discover songs that help me you know, in my songwriting. I discover new artists through playlists. I'm not really making, I can't make the fans that I want to make off of Spotify because Spotify's data can't be extracted. Like um, if, if we ever talked about social media advertising, I would go into my social media advertising platform and show you what I mean. Um, I can, if someone watches my music video on YouTube, I can actually take that data and upload it into Facebook and vice versa. I can cross promote, I can retarget. That's the important thing is taking, I wanna take everyone who watched more than 50% of my video. So now we've excluded everyone under that. Okay, now I wanna take these people and I'm gonna show them a second video. So you're making them warmer and warmer and warmer until they're at the end of the funnel and they're actual you know, customers of yours. You can't do that with streaming. So to me, the reason why I invest in Spotify is for the vanity metrics. When someone goes to my profile and they see, you know, one monthly listener, a hundred monthly listeners, a thousand monthly listeners, that's, as far as getting gigs, that's the only thing people look at. I am not saying buy bots or whatever. However, I wouldn't prioritize doing, say, a traffic campaign from Instagram to Spotify. Um, because you can get the same and sometimes more results by doing a social or a Spotify playlist campaign. Um, that's something we go into in the course. Uh, there are a few web pages, M I C C O. Um, they do give you access to playlist um, names, like they have the name of the playlist, the, the curator, their contact information. Um, something you can get your interns to do. The only data that you would be able to see if you were to run that type of campaign from like say Instagram to Spotify is who clicked the link. But that, it's not telling you who liked the song and who didn't. 
So that's something to think about. Uh, if anyone wanted to talk more about it, we certainly can. Um, so let's put it all together. And um, I promise we're almost done. Like 30 more slides, I promise. You guys are troopers. Um, you know, we talked about active and passive income. So we're back to our list. And the one I really, really want to focus on, the two, are merch and membership income. I believe that every single musician or band, solo artist, whatever, should be focusing on merch and apparel as much as music. Why? Because it is a physical representation of our music. What is ethereal, transcendent, is now represented in you know, a, a physical, tangible, easily sellable way. And if we do our pocket aces and we've established this non-musical, this honest and genuine profile, we know, okay, cool, we wrote the summer banger, it's about this, it's about that. So I wanna do a tank top that looks like this. Or, um, you know, I wrote a, I don't know if I'm gonna poke a little bit of fun at metal, I love metal. I'm a metal band, right? So I'm gonna have tree branch font and I'm gonna have like red and black, right? But you, we love it, right? We love it because it looks a certain way, it feels a certain way, it's why it sells. Um, we all, myself included, have the, the classic black t-shirt, white band name, you know, white yeah. letter band name. We need that. That's our evergreen item. It's, we know that that thing will sell. But that can't be the only thing we do. You know, we need to think, like, I wish we had the, the ability to run um, a whole... If I had the resources, me be transparent, I can't imagine the apparel line that we could have done with Monster. Like, there's something we might still explore. Um, like, uh, actually, Adam has um, a really good brand, like Bella and Canvas, the softest. I have a few um, Bella Canvas uh, hoodies that I like, and um, they are the softest, which is a great selling point, and uh, they're not that expensive. Bella Canvas is great quality, not that expensive to get, um, and you can represent it in so many different ways and colors, and people like me, who will fall victim to FOMO, and good advertising. I'm like, ooh, I really want the burgundy, the black, the this. I'm gonna just get all of them, so I don't have to choose. <laughs> and you can do that. So we have to start thinking like a store, like a boutique store. Um, I, no, we're gonna go through it. There are four main ways that I like to focus on increasing profit, increasing prices, decreasing expenses, increasing the number of customers, and increasing the items purchased per customer. I'm not gonna go into as much detail uh, because there are stuff uh, later that I want to get to. But common sense as far as increasing prices, the thing that we need to be careful of is that can't be the only thing we do because at a certain point it becomes too unmanageable. Even our biggest fans will go, $60 for a hoodie? What are you doing? Um, so we need to focus on decreasing our expenses. And you didn't know that you were coming into an accounting class, but very quickly, something that I know not very many of us do, I certainly just started doing it maybe a year or two ago, so I feel you. There is a difference between net and gross, right? Gross revenue, money, your company earns, no expenses taken out. I sell you know, five t-shirts at $10, I get $50, that's my gross revenue. Gross profit is our gross revenue minus cost of goods sold, um, and net profit is the profit after expenses have been deducted, also known as your bottom line. Now, when you start getting into the weeds of like, personal accounting, business accounting, there's always like one person in some of these lectures that's like, actually, I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. So this is very, very simple. It's, it's broken down in a simple way. So uh, let's assume we have t-shirts for $24 each. We've sold 100 t-shirts. We have made $2,400, um, and that is our gross revenue. And I'm sorry, my apologies. This was, I did not edit this correctly. So. Uh, let's do gross profit, which once again is our gross revenue minus our cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold, very simply, how much did this hoodie cost Adam, right? Let's say, you know, our t-shirts uh, cost us $4 to make, right? So we sold 100 of them, so our cost of goods is 400, 2400 minus 400 is 2000, this should be a zero. 2000 is our gross profit. Net profit, this is our profit after all expenses have been deducted. So let's just say for all intents and purposes, all of our expenses is $1,500. So we've made $2,000 this year, let's just say that. Our expenses is $1,500, so $500 is our profit. 
Now again, there are some people that are that would argue that this isn't really true profit until after you pay your taxes. You know, it's nothing. I'm not going to get into the weeds of that. Uh, but the important thing is, we talked about in the beginning of this lecture, expenses. As musicians, every single thing we spend money on with regards to our music is a write-off, is an expense. Shipping costs, studio time, advertising, guitar strings, gu drum, drum heads, gas to the shows. I, I think, what, gas is like 59 cents now? 58, 58 50, cents? 57. 57, okay, I'm down. All right, 57. All right. So 57 cents to uh, to a mile. So uh, for anyone that does, uh, you know, uh, move on to the course, we do uh, kind of break that down. We get you that expense sheet. And um, what I recommend you do is say you you go through your calendar. You say, okay, I played in Baltimore. You take your address or the address of your legal entity, like your house, might be an office, and you put it on Google Maps. And yep, you see how many miles. Multiply that by the uh, you know the 57 cents, and that's how much you're writing off. Um, and also, eventually, as your business and band make more money, you're going to factor in your salary. Your salary is an expense, right? So, in an ideal world, right, we have established enough of a revenue that we can say, I'm going to start paying myself every month. And that's something that you can start to calculate. Um, after expenses are considered, we want to increase the number of customers. This is the entire purpose of marketing and advertising. The more people that purchase from you, the more money you make. However, I want you to imagine that I own a, a store that sells clothes, right? Jeans, let's say jeans. And I invite all of my friends and family to come. They come and uh, they either buy the jeans or they don't. The people that needed it, they bought it. The people that didn't, didn't buy it. Well, after every one of my friends and family has either decided to come or to not come, to buy, not to buy. I don't have any more people to sell to unless I get new product. It's kind of what we do as musicians, right? We sell tickets to the same people, they either come or they don't come. That's our prime base, right? It's our friends and family. So this whole build it and they will come mentality, it's an incomplete mentality, right? No one's gonna come if they don't know it exists. So we need to make sure that we have the best song in the world, if no one's heard it, then it's not really serving, it's not serving us in any way. So our friends and family that have supported us independently of our music, they're our, they're our prime base. You know, maybe local musicians that we know. Um, I'm not saying that they're not true fans, but this is what we want to increase. We want to increase our fan base. People that have supported us because of our music. They found us on Facebook or they, you know, Instagram or they saw us live and they just fell in love with us. These are the people that are going to make us money and make us feel incredible about what we're doing. Uh, another thing that most musicians do not utilize, and everyone should, increasing the number of items sold per customer. So yeah, having everyone in this room buying a hoodie, Adam's gonna be happy about that. But if everyone in this room bought a hoodie, a hat, a beanie, and a, and a drum head, he'd be even happier because the amount of time and resources that it took to get you guys here hasn't increased. But all that it's increased is the money that has come in. So the way that we do that as musicians is the same way, right? If we keep customer lists, then we're able to have a record of what people bought, what, they're, um, what they might buy in the future. We know who they are, where they're from, what did they buy, how many items, and was it, what, was it at one time or was it multiple times um, afterward? And of course, based on this, we can predict what they might buy in the future. Now, by knowing, <clears throat> knowing this, let's kind of go off of an example. Mary buys a ticket to your show in Baltimore, Maryland. You know her name, you know where she's from, and you know what she bought. Now, this information is available to us through our webpage, like because of our, uh, our e-commerce webpage, or um, from the venue, if you're selling tickets, it's, you know, that I think it's always helpful to reach out to a venue if they're making you sell tickets through their webpage to get a name of um, a list of everyone that bought tickets for you. That way you can keep it for your record. Now, um, oh, here, my apologies. Uh, yes, oh, I repeated that, sorry about that. Uh, now, one thing that we can do, I know, I, put, I chose the wrong color for this very bright screen, my apologies. Let's say Mary bought a ticket, it's a week before the show, two weeks before the show. We, we experience this all the time with Amazon. 
we were like, I'm not buying anything today. And then Amazon's like, Athena, you want this cat pencil you've been looking at for 10 hours? And you're like, I need this cat pencil. Buy. You know, musicians don't do that, right? Like, I bought an album from St. Vincent's webpage. Other than, like, random updates, I don't get those. I would buy more things if I felt like it was, a, like, a, not, you know, I'm not saying that I need her to email me to buy something, but it would be nice to get something like this. Mary, can't wait to meet you at the show in Baltimore. We appreciate it more than you know. We'd like to give you 10% off any apparel in our store. Hope you rock it at the show. What if they go for it, right? And what did it cost you to do? It didn't cost you anything to do. Um, now let's assume she bought it. She bought a t-shirt, she came to the show, she loved it, you know, everything went great. You're coming back to Baltimore, you're, you're planning on it, right? Now, you have her information, not only did she respond by buying a ticket, but she responded to that email. So if it worked once, maybe it'll work again. Mary, we wanted to give you a heads up that we're coming back to Baltimore. Since you came last time, we'd love to shoot you another code for being so freaking awesome. We got some new tank tops just released. Hope to see you again. Again, she might buy it, she might not. But no band that I know does this. None. None. And we don't need to be Amazon. We don't need to be, you know, Lady Gaga to do this. Lady Gaga doesn't even do this. But if we keep these systems in place, we can do that and increase our, um, increase our revenue. Because again, pocket aces, we're putting out visually stimulating stuff, right? Putting out things that people really like. And all e-commerce pl uh, plugins and sites have the ability to create maintain export customer list. It's very simple. Yes, you could do it yourself with an Excel sheet. Um, at any point that you're able to log who bought what, if you're using Square, Square has, a, I think, a great inventory system. Shopify is fantastic. Um, you know, if, you're, if you have a merch booth and someone paid, paid with cash, I would try to get that information or have create a system in person to be able to do that. Um, you know, even if you just get a first name, it would be great, or to direct them to some type of, um, uh, like, a, like a list that they can sign to give their name and information. Anything that you can maintain to tell you who bought what, their potential customers want, their customers want, they can be potential customers again. Um, now, I want to quickly go through different ways that we as musicians can package our merchant apparel to think like a store. Uh, collections, capsules, and limited runs. Evergreen items are kind of like our tried and true black, uh, white on black t-shirts and vice versa. They're typically our, they're not our most expensive products to make, so they're always good to have on hand. Collections are a combination of low to no cost items that basically fluff around a primary item. This allows you to mark up the price, resulting in profit without increase expenses so let's do an example uh, we release a new shirt uh, release a new single uh, and so we're putting out a new t-shirt right that's our primary product we would normally sell that for what 20 20 bucks let's say 20 bucks um, now let's say we add a handwritten note some stickers some buttons how much do stickers cost us cents you know uh, same with thing with buttons if they only cost us let's say the cumulative cost us two dollars both to make we can now increase the price of this to um, 25, 27, if we're adding you know, some cool stuff, say 25. We haven't added, you know, this is, this is the product that's getting the price bump, your t-shirt. Now where 25 may have seemed a bit much for that t-shirt, just by adding a handwritten note, stickers, whatever, you're making it seem like the consumer or the customer is getting more. Um, which increases the amount of profit that you're making. Uh, a capsule is kind of like a collection, but very much like a time capsule. It's meant to sort of be a snapshot of a certain period, right? Um, merch package is, that is designed and curated around a specific release. I like capsules because they increase the value of a single. The single will no longer be sort of a throwaway thing. Yes, if you want to do singles on Spotify, that's fantastic, but you could come up with creative ways to still make people not only buy the single, but to also buy the package around it. So, okay, let's just say Prism Waves just released their new single, Aries, which has a very summer meets Pulp Fiction vibe. 
They have three different designs that draw from the musical style and the music video. So all together, what we offer in the package, the single with a drop card or a QR code format, this single includes the original version, maybe an acoustic version, and like a few different remixes. The package includes one of three shirt designs. It includes the but three buttons of all the designs. It includes the postcard that hi highlights all the other Aries designs, and then a handwritten note. So we have one product that for sure will cost us money, which is the shirt. The buttons, again, low cost. The postcard, super low cost. And then the handwritten note does not cost us anything. So all together, we can package this for what, $30? If it's something that people want, if the t-shirt looks good, people are gonna get it. Now, another thing, I haven't yet explored this, um, so maybe you guys will get to it before I do, is capsules, right? You can, ha you can do the exact same uh, tiered capsules. You can do the exact same um, capsule that we had in the previous slide, but make people choose or have people choose. Do you want a capsule based off of design one, design two, design three? Or for the very, very few super fans that you have, create a capsule that has all three designs with a slight price bump. Um, you can also do a create your own. This gives the consumer freedom to choose and you don't have to mark it up from the first one. You can sort of give them that freedom. Um, no one does this. No one does this. Um, I do want to talk about the importance of considering drop card QR code formats of not only singles but albums as well. Um, there are no cars that are new that have CDs. Um, I do, uh, I teach uh, composition classes in uh, high schools and I very often ask, you know, 14, 15 year olds, like, what do you use to, you know, X, Y, and Z? And uh, they buy CDs, and the only time they ever bought CDs is when it was available at a live show, that's the only thing they had, but they use it as a memento, right? Okay, that's a really interesting. So why would we spend the money that it cost us to get it from disc makers, when if they're only using it as a memento, like a physical representation of this thing, why not have it cost us less money? So an example is, you can have an entire album, and instead of, you know, the price of a CD, what you can do is do a drop card or a postcard. You could frame that drop card or a postcard, uh, or package it in a super cool way. And think about what's a what's a part of a CD, right? We had the lyrics, we had a design, we had a physical representation of the music, and then we had the music itself. So the drop card allows us to still charge ten dollars for our full length. But what did it cost us? A dollar to make, as opposed to however much it cost us to make, you know. The, the CDs. We can throw in a poster, we can throw in a lyric book, or if we don't want to do that, we can do handwritten or go on Fiverr and find someone who has really cool calligraphy writing and just have like lyrics written of one song. Like We can be so inventive with how we package the, our music. And this, where we would have normally charged $10 for a CD that cost us a lot more, like maybe $5 each, $6 each, we now can charge $10, maybe $15 for the whole package and have, us, have it cost us far less. Uh, so this is the stuff that we need to start thinking about. Limited runs, if you're gonna do limited runs, commit to it or else don't do it. No one is happy when they're like, buy this right now, it's never gonna be back and then in a month it's back. And we're just like, what, and now it's cheaper. So if you want to explore different types of products, if you want to test certain things out, you can certainly do that, just commit to it. If a design really did well, you could, you know, grandfather it into a regular line, or you can say, um, you know, we're taking this design and we're, we're doing it slightly differently. But I want to throw this in, it's just a lot harder to, um, to do that. So examples of limited runs, different versions of other products, unique merch, uh, of course, like say you always wear a jean jacket, right? You only have one of these jean jackets. You could sell off your jean jacket or you can do a limited run of similar looking jean jackets and sell them for a higher price. Um, it's definitely something to consider. Evergreen items, again, these are your tried and true, white on black, black on white. They are the cheapest to make. They're also the ones that always sell. Um, so they do well each and every time, something to think about. Um, I will zoom past a few more. You guys are so good. Um, 
Membership options for supporters, this only succeeds with proper planning, budgeting, and execution. I can't tell you how many Kickstarters I have given my $25 to and I have never seen a song, right? It's pretty sad. Uh, if you're gonna do tiered stuff like Patreon, make sure that what you're giving matches the donation, not just for the person donating, but also for you, don't overpromise. Like if you're gonna be like, for $5, I'm gonna get you, Da, 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 da. you're not turning a profit. So it's something to, to really think about. And if you do have a good plan, like uh, Scott's old band, when they had their Patreon, they were pulling 2K a month. One of their tiers had uh, that they would record a live version of them doing a cover once a month, it went out. Well, what they did is that they picked a weekend every three months and they filmed three or four videos at a time. So they already had it planned. And then all they needed to do was just wait for that time and go. Uh, warnings again, uh, be thorough, don't be late, um, and then ensure that you're always profiting. And uh, consider the frequency of delivery, right? Now, this can get pretty creative uh, as far as does the math work out? Are your supporters staying? How's your retention rate? But it's something to consider. You guys are troopers, awesome, thank you. If you are interested, thank you. I know I went so over, um, that's something to file away and fix for next time. Um, if you are interested in checking it out, uh, we are thecadencelabs.com. Uh, anyone who's here uh, giving a 30 minute free consultation, you can use it, you cannot use it, you do not have an expiration date on it. My email is athena at popriotmusic.com. Yeah, feel free to get up and